and uh, just want to say a, a, a quick welcome to the first of this term's um, curatorial conversations here at the Warburg Institute. Um, now, as most of you probably know by now, this series uh, of curatorial conversations was started a few years ago, uh, still in person, pre-Zoom, um, to feature uh, curatorial projects uh, of particular interest to the Warburg community uh, and its extended audiences. Um, and normally, um, the behind the scenes look uh, of a curatorial project focuses on an exhibition, uh, sometimes uh, a gallery project, a rehang, or a, a particularly interesting new project in a gallery setting. And a few times we've actually looked uh, at uh, curating a whole museum. Um, we've had a couple of those uh, uh, in the past, and this year the next one is coming up, which is Dulwich Picture Gallery with Jenny Scott, the, the director there. So those are the uh, typical uh, curatorial conversations. This is an unusual one for a couple of reasons. One is because what is being curated is unusual. Um, uh, and the other is because none of the three speakers are really curators in the traditional sense. So uh, I hope you'll find this as interesting uh, as, as I'm expecting it to be. Um, what is being curated is an absolutely extraordinary house that started as a, a private uh, and domestic project and has now been opened to the public uh, as part of the foundation that you'll hear about. And uh, the curators, and this of course is the, the, the now uh, infamous Cosmic House, um, the architectural and intellectual project by uh, Charles Jenks and his wife Maggie. And uh, the curators are, and the people you will hear from are, uh, Esther Steierhofer, who is the artistic director for the Jenks Foundation uh, that looks after the house. Uh, Edwin Heathcote, who um, many of you will know as uh, the great architectural critic for the Financial Times uh, in particular. Uh, go back and read his fantastic article on the Warburg Institute not too long ago. Um, but actually, Eddie's uh, role here is as the uh, Jenks designated Keeper of Meaning, that is his official title, as well as chair of the steering group for the whole project. And last but not least, uh, the artist Marisha Lewandowska, who is, I think, the inaugural year-long artist in residence for the Jenks Foundation. Um, so three really interesting perspectives uh, on the house and its projects. Um, we're going to have a guided tour of the house and its contexts, uh, a little bit of the history that led to its creation, and a little bit about the activities that are bringing it to life. We're very lucky because at the moment um, it did open to the public for a couple of months, I think, and is now uh, closed for a little while and then will be reopened in a few months. So we're, we're getting, uh, uh, we, are, we are literally visiting uh, behind uh, closed doors at the moment. And, getting this special view from those who are uh, looking after the place. Uh, and we will then all be inspired, I'm sure, to go and visit uh, when it reopens in a couple of months. So without further ado, I will uh, hand over to each of the, the three uh, curators in turn, um, and they will uh, take us on this introductory tour. And then we'll have a little bit of time to discuss uh, the uh, activities from a, a curatorial project perspective uh, with me uh, asking some questions and then you should store up anything that interests you because you'll be given an opportunity to pose some questions to them as well. Um, as usual, you can do that uh, in one of two ways. You can either raise your hand using the raise hand button under the reactions tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen or you can always just type a question into the chat uh, and I will be monitoring that and uh, we'll be happy to pose the question to the appropriate person for you. So two options. Um, and I think that's about it. Um, Esther, are you ready to go? Let's do yeah, it. Thank you, Bill. Um, okay, I will sure. share my screen. Um, 
So good evening, everyone. And thank you, Bia, for the fantastic introduction and for inviting us and hosting us tonight. Great pleasure. Thanks um, for coming. So it's I actually as a tiny a tiny correction perhaps I do come from quite traditional art history curatorial backgrounds so I have been working as a curator although it is right to say that it is quite an unusual thing to curate and the title of the title of the talk curating the cosmic house is something that we can come back to and talk a little bit more about it am I really curating the cosmic house? I'm, I'm not quite sure if that's the most accurate way of putting it. Um, so my, my role is artistic director, so I'm mainly responsible for the program um, of the Jenks Foundation. But the, tonight we decided to divide up this presentation among the three of us. And it's uh, quite a polyphonic approach and hopefully you have quite a polyphonic image of the house through my perspective, describing the house as the site of the Jenks Foundation and kind of uh, site of the archive and something that is generating, helping us to generate the program and generate discourse. And then Eddie, who has been anointed the keeper of meaning and also our um, um, chair of our steering group and who has been contributing a lot of content and also the author of our guidebook, which is a very important tool for the interpretation of the Cosmic House. He will be giving um, a guided, a virtual guided tour and talking to the, to the house more from a um, probably more from, and Eddie, you might correct me if I'm wrong, but probably situated more in relation to its place in the history of architecture, history of design, and also introducing a little bit the very complex symbolic program, which is probably impossible in 10 minutes. And then Marisha is going to come in from yet another point of view as our first artist in residence, Marisha's uh, practice, which she has been developing in the last decades around her interest in the public role of archives and collections. It's a very interesting moment for us because we are just establishing our archive, we are cataloging and we are kind of establishing also the boundaries around where, where are the boundaries of the archive, where the archive of the Cosmic House starts and ends. And we're working together with a number of external and internal archivists, um, um, but also it's really uh, refreshing to kind of do research um, immediately into the, a deep research uh, into the archive and seeing it through the eye of an artist practitioner. Marisha's project is titled Voicing the Archive and she's going to um, talk about that a little bit more but she is mainly interested in the collaboration and the collaborative voices that emerge from the archive and in particular the role of women and how they shaped the project of the Cosmic House. So to come back a little bit, I will be about five, 10 minute introduction um, to talk to you a little bit about what the Jenks Foundation is um, and the program. The Jenks Foundation has been very recently established after the recent passing of Charles Jenks in 2019. And the primary role of the Jenks Foundation is dual. The, the firstly is uh, to open the cosmic house to the public. And secondly, is to maintain it as a place where conversations about the public role of architecture and its ways of communicating meaning can continue to flourish. Uh, so in some ways to make material from our archive available, but also to connect it with contemporary discourse. And so inviting in uh, practitioners and thinkers to spend time with us and um, engage in conversations and collaboration. So to give you a little bit of um, very brief background about the Cosmic House itself, which Eddie will give a much more thorough introduction to, but it's originally, it, it was titled the Thematic House and it has been rechristened as the Cosmic House relatively recently before it was decided to be opened as a public uh, museum, public institution. And it was designed um, together uh, by Maggie and Charles Jenks in collaboration with Terry Farrell Architects and a number of other artists and designers and architects such as Eduardo Paolozzi, Michael Graves, Celia Scott, and so on and so forth. Um, the, the house was designed between 1978 and 83. 
uh, so it's kind of for those who are more familiar with Charles's writing and work, it is a time uh, that is parallel with his first kind of thesis and the first time when he published his um, um, language of postmodern architecture and he worked out his thesis of postmodernism in relation to architecture. So in some ways, the house is the manifesto, it's the built manifesto of postmodernism for him. And um, it's quite interesting to see those parallels and dialogue between the practice and the theory and how he was kind of trying to put forward an argument through the design of this house. Although, a couple of years later in an article that he published as a conversation in between uh, the critic, Charles Jenks as the critic and Charles Jenks as the architect, he, he, he concluded that he's more of a critic who architects rather than an architect who critiques. Um, so in some ways, um, the house has been kind of re renamed as, as the Cosmic House. And I'm not quite sure if um, Charles had um, Gaston Bachelard in mind uh, when he was doing that, but there's a quite wonderful um, quote um, by, by Bachelard, which is referring to a house of once as a real cosmos in every sense of the world. So, uh, you know, the Cosmic House with all of its fittings, it's part of our archive, but it is also the container of a larger archive. So just to give you a little bit of a sense of what the archive consists of, and it obviously kind of includes all the material that kind of related to Charles's multivalent work, uh, the first big kind of very roughly group of materials are his work as an architecture historian, architecture critique, these manuscripts and the architecture library uh, that is upstairs. I forgot to say that the three of us are actually uh, calling in from three different places in the house. I'm sitting in the basement in the room of doubles. Um, the library is right above me. Um, and then the second kind of big uh, group of material, which is um, Charles turned his interest towards, um, also in collaboration with Maggie or with the influence of Maggie, is the land art and landscape architecture, which was mainly after the 1990s. And um, the third big group of materials is um, the collection of material that relates to the Maggie's cancer care centers that he co-founded um, with Maggie and all the literature and material. And he was, he was also patron uh, of these centers. So Charles's multivalent approach really inspires a similarly multidisciplinary attitude for the program of the Jenks Foundation, which is organized around annual teams. Um, and uh, the public program consists of, a, of an annual exhibition, one exhibition per year, which is um, exhibited in the house. There's the, a new gallery space, which I think Eddie might be introducing. Uh, but it's the only new addition to the house since we opened it as a museum and it was um, uh, designed by Charles Jenks in collaboration by Lily Jenks, who's um, Charles's daughter and director of the Jenks Foundation. And um, the exhibition is integrating each team and it's complemented and accompanied by talks and new commissions and publications. And it's mainly powered or informed by a second arm of our program, which is a semi-public program, which we describe as a, often described as laboratory program, um, which is a slower, more meandering uh, research-based program, which is um, based in the archive and spirals out from the archive and is um, based on research residencies and other collaborations. So um, the next five minutes, I think that I would just spend with trying to illustrate this and walk you through a little bit our um, website that we just literally launched a week ago. It's a new publishing platform or editorial project for us. And in some ways, if the Cosmic House is the physical building, 
of the Jenks Foundation, then this website is trying to become its virtual building. Um, and um, so similar to our public program, the website is the website is a little bit of a depository of our public program in many ways. Uh, but it's again, it's a tool to make the archive and material from the archive available and accessible as widely as possible. It's not a catalog, it's very heavily edited and you know, our catalog probably won't be available for the next two years yet, unfortunately online, but we're trying to publish and release as much material as possible here. But besides archival material, we also are very keen, as I mentioned, to engage with contemporary thinkers and practitioners and commission them to initiate and, and to, to debate and start dialogue with some of the key ideas from the archive. So the two um, first content themes around which the website um, develops, the first one is isms and wasms, which is basically a Jenksianism. We borrowed it from uh, Charles. Uh, Charles used isms and wasms in a title of an exhibition. It was um, more, more precisely, it was saying when what all wasms become isms. Uh, and it was a display, a small display um, at Portuguese's um, Venice Biennial in uh, 1980, when, um, which basically was the first architecture uh, biennial in Venice. And it was kind of inaugurating or announcing the arrival of postmodern in architecture as a new paradigm. And Charles was responsible contributing as a critique. And he also contributed with this small um, exhibition at the Arsenale, which took the shape of a ginormous pencil, seven meter tall. And on the uh, six sides of the pencil, he kind of diagrammed his six streams or six traditions of postmodern architecture. In some ways, that was Charles's atlas of postmodern architecture, um, if you will. And he kind of included both the historical images related to these different traditions and some contemporary images to map. This is something that he continued doing uh, throughout his um, um, time and period uh, uh, research. He was kind of mapping and writing about isms and wasms, the uh, multiple plural kind of movements, both within modern and postmodern architecture. And this section of the website is actually bringing together material from the archive, some original writing and essays from Charles and also lectures. Um, this is a slide from the Strada Novissima um, at, the, um, at the Venice Biennial, by directed by Portuguese and um, as photographed by Charles and as in his um, big slide library that we are digitizing at the moment. And also it brings together um, this section of the website, a number of new commissions, new texts and contributions. Um, we invited um, writers, artists and architects to respond to the question, what is what was postmodern? from various different point of views. So this is a contribution, for instance, by Justin Beer, but we have contributions by Glenn Adamson, um, Stephen Connor, Leah Catherine Saka, and so on. And then um, the other team of the website is architistics, architectures, linguistics, and other uh, hybrid word created by Jenks, um, and we borrowed it from one of his early essays that he published, Meaning in Architecture, um, where he first started to explore his interest between architecture and semiotics. And this section of the website is containing material that um, we accumulated through the research related to the opening of the Cosmic House. So we opened the Cosmic House with a small exhibition called Cosmic Comic Cosmetic, which is contextualizing the histories and the design of the house and the symbolic program of the house. But through this kind of first dive into the Cosmic House archive about the history of the Cosmic House itself, a lot of other material emerged. So this um, section of the website gives a little bit of an insight into that. And just to come back to that question of curating the cosmic house, well, I think that 
all that we can do is to think about different layers of interpretation. So in this first year, what we have been doing is um, besides the small display, we commissioned the filmmaker uh, Zucata uh, to create a film about the house. And Eddie has also contributed with a wonderful, very thoroughly written guidebook. And we have a very subtle um, wayfinding system to not to try to lose our visitors <laughs> too much in the labyrinths um, when they are exploring the house but uh, uh, no doubt probably this um, these layers of interpretation will continue um, in the future and probably we will keep developing new projects and new new interpretations but I think that this is the moment when I could probably pass on uh, to Eddie to give us the tour of the house. That's great. Thank you so much, Esther. And uh, Eddie, over to you. Well, hi, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. And thanks, uh, Esther, for your very generous uh, uh, introduction there and Bill too. Um, and you'll see from you will have heard from Bill's um, uh, introduction that I have this enigmatic and uh, frankly, uh, super cool, super cool job title here, the keeper of meaning. And uh, I mean, it's it's a gag, of course. Um, you know, curators in the big museums were, were historically known as keepers, uh, as you know, but in, in the current orthodoxy of what curators are supposed to do, there's there's a kind of irony to that name. I mean, you know, it, it, as if they, they, they shouldn't be keeping stuff, they should be sharing stuff. So uh, it should, should be a kind of much more publicly spirited name. But I guess, although Charles never uh, actually defined my role here. He just kind of, as, as you know, as, as Esther said, anointed me the keeper of meaning. Um, I think what he meant was that my role is to ensure that meaning in some way is kept at the heart of, of what we do. And meaning obviously is it's actually in architecture is quite a controversial thing. Um, you know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of discourse at the moment about architecture not having any, the, the, the way it shouldn't have any meaning, it should be purely objective, which is, you know, might be a total impossibility and Charles is too, but that's a, that's a whole other rabbit hole. Um, as, as Esther uh, said, this house, the Cosmic House was built between 78 and actually, I think, I think it was only finished in 85, she said 83 when, when the, when the most of it was done, but I think 85 was it was finally done. Um, so it's kind of the, the period between, uh, you know, I think I've said between disco and the big bang. Uh, and and there, there's something of that in the house. There's a kind of, you know, there are mirrored ceilings and a lot of kind of funky detail and a sort of sense of complete freedom in London, a, a moment of an explosion of creative and, um, uh, a kind of in a way almost like the post-war consensus was collapsing and things were exploding into a million different fragments um by that time jinx was already christened the uh, the pope of postmodernism, and uh it, he was its, its its chief theorist critic and propagandist and the house is his attempt as esther said to manifest those ideas in in built form um uh, to give you a bit of background, James believed that late modern architecture, that diluted corporate um, form of, of 1970s building, had lost its, let's say, its, its political, its spiritual, its aesthetic agenda, and with it, the power that architecture has to move, the, uh, as well as the kind of the meaning and the, and the message of early modernism. So what had started as a radical renewal of the accommodation of, of, of mankind had been uh, bastardized into a bland, car-centric, um, unthinking kind of armature for consumption and corporate culture. Architecture had, in effect, it has lost any semblance of meaning and become a kind of alienating thing. You know, Jenks was very involved in the discourse around the the problems that modernism was facing. You know, you know, the way that the housing had alienated people and was encouraging crime and so on. It's another very controversial. Uh, area now which i'm not going to go into but um uh, it's it's been considerably reassessed now actually but anyway that's no that's for another day so his idea we might say was to re-enchant architecture using history reference playfulness and to attempt to re-engage a public uh, which had which had become disenchanted effectively with modernism so to do this 
he had to search for a theme. Um, the question was, what was the theme? What would the theme be in the in the in the seventies and early eighties? So religion no longer had the pull it once did, you know, with the Gothic cathedrals or the Baroque churches. Modernism had shed its manifestos, so it wasn't it didn't have the kind of the political uh, power. It was a fading force. Um, technology, which was being celebrated by Richard Rogers and Norman Foster in the Pompidou Center, which was just built just before the building was this building was started. Well that also could be interpreted as a kind of alienating, rather existentially empty uh, uh, um, language of architecture, which almost almost uh, dismissed the idea that, that architecture itself could have any influence and it should be replaced by air conditioning systems and ducts. Um, so uh, what's left, you know, and, and, uh, and I, what Charles thought that was left was the the universe. <laughs> you know, what is there that that could still uh, engage audiences with a sense of um, existential curiosity? Well, it was the it was the cosmos, and where were the big discoveries, the scientific discoveries being made? Remember, this is still the the Apollo program is still going, and so on. The space shuttle is being designed, so the Hubble telescope, all of these things. That the the big the 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 real interest in contemporary science was. Um, the cosmos, and it had been the preoccupation of traditional architectures until modernism. Effectively, though, you know that was the theme that that preoccupied all the builders of the great monuments, the, the pyramids, and the temples. Uh, so he alighted on this on this subject: the cosmic, the universe, and our place in it. Um, and his big idea was what he called double coding: the way in which you could communicate ideas through uh, apparently pop mechanisms. Uh, an architecture that could be read purely as decorative or, or um, fun, but which could be understood at another level as a microcosm of the macrocosmic. And this is it. Esther's taken you through the, the virtual platform we have, and I'm now very, very briefly going to talk you through the uh, the physical space and house. Here's the, um, uh, here's the house as it appears from the street. Um, and if we go to the next slide, the um yeah this is the cosmic oval so this is where it all began this is this is charles's picture of the of the cosmos it's the lobby effectively you can just about see the fan light at the front door or less just off to the left of the middle there it's this is this is an elliptical complex universe still expanding not the perfect um static circle of the renaissance uh, but but a space in which points have a more oblique relationship to each other. And I think it's an interesting place for us to start the tour uh, because it creates a link to Abby Warburg's reading room in, in his library in Hamburg. As, as I understand it, Warburg's library was conceived as a, as a tool for making connections between symbols, myths, uh, images, words, and seeing those connections as part of a larger web, giving a, 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 an afterlife to antiquity. Um, here in, uh, in, in Holland Park, Jenks sets up not, um, not books in those cabinets, but mirrored doors as potential gateways, each one a path to a, a new potential world. And in fact, they lead to meter cupboards and cloak rooms and blank spaces where we store our catalogs, but that's precisely the joke. Jenks, Jenks always does this. He sets up the, the, the big proposition and then deflates it. One door leads to, I think there might be one more shot, sorry, yesterday, there might be one more shot of the, of the cosmic oval from above. You can see there's that, that, that elliptical universe and the, and the um, tension between the, uh, the rectangular and the elliptical and then the circle at the center or the black hole. Um, and one of those doors, one of those mirrored doors leads to the cosmic loo which is, is another one of uh, Jenks's kind of deflations of the pomposted, the whole idea of this thing. Uh, it's a space which blends the reuse of old fittings and existing Victorian uh, sink and Charles's own preoccupations, including a, there's a wall of postcards you can just about see there uh, as a kind of dado rail to fiddle with while you're sitting on the toilet. Um, the ground floor of the house is arranged uh, in the form of a year. Um, a circuit around the season, starting here with winter, which is where uh, Mauritia is sitting. So you'll see her 
uh, later in the day, she's sitting there just kind of on one side of me. Uh, there's Hephaestus, the Roman god of the hearth and the forge, modelled by Eduardo Palozzi, sitting above the, um, at the above the fireplace there on a on a tall plinth, sculpted by Celia Scott. Palozzi also did a, a mosaic here. You can see a stair and on the left there. If you go down right, right down at the bottom of that stair, it, it, there's a there's a mosaic of a black hole, also executed by Palozzi. Um, so the, the fireplace is designed by Michael Graves, who then went on to um, uh, design the Disney HQ with the seven dwarves as caryatids. So you can always see there's always a kind of a, 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 there's something something that looks like a serious gesture, and then somehow you notice other things that spin off it in, in its context, which undermine that seriousness. Um, the dark colors of winter then give way to the brightness of spring um, and uh, the sundial arcade um, there, that's right, which is a, a kind of conversation pit, really. It was, it's a lowered area so that you could, it was just Maggie's idea that that, that that seating area should be lowered so that you have a clear view from the house through to the garden without the, the seats impinging. Uh, on it. Maggie was always keen to, to be able to be conscious of the greenery. Uh, and uh, there are these kind of rather pompous, uh, yuppie-ish uh, curtain swags, look a bit like something out of a Tom Wolfe uh, set piece there. And they're, But they're intended to represent the clouds, London's clouds looming in on the landscape always, the grey London sky. Um, from there you move on to the dining room uh, and then the kitchen which uh, which is, is, so the dining room is, is summer and then the, the kitchen is Indian summer. You'll see a little, a tiny little clip at the end of this of Charles in the, Charles and Maggie in the kitchen talking about the, um, the, the meaning and the, again, the kind of ridiculousness of the <laughs> conceit. Um, and all of these seasons revolve around the solar stair uh, which I mentioned right at the bottom there, you can see the, the Paolozzi mosaic of the black hole, which I, uh, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, and that stair functions as a kind of vortex running through the house, the spiraling uh, galaxy, the spiraling arm of the galaxy, but also represents the orbit of the earth and the moon around the sun. There are um, 52 steps and 365 lines inscribed within all of those uh, steps and if you were to alight on the step which represented the 20th of June which was Charles's birthday and almost the summer solstice not quite but almost the summer solstice it's about halfway up the building uh, you come into the architectural library um, sorry one more there you go which is which is where, which is where I was going to be talking from but it turned out the wi-fi was not good enough <laughs> so uh uh, there you have it. I guess all those all those books get in the way of the signal. Um, this is Charles's uh, notion of of a kind of form follows function. Why wouldn't the bookshelves that you have your books on uh, follow the form of the subjects that the books are on? So uh, if you have it, you have it, you might have a, a section on Roman architecture and then you'll have a kind of temple front on, on that. You might have New York, which is a skyscraper uh, and so on. So the, the, it's a kind of um, architectural joke that the, this, this city uh, skyline reflects the subject matter of the books. It, it went completely uh, skew if because he obviously accumulated more books than he thought and search and certain sections filled up and and uh, uh, you know others others had, had less than he expected so th this kind of system is it just shows the impossibility of, of doing anything like this really you can't predetermine what your future preoccupations are going to be and in the center of the room there are these slide scrapers which house the enormous um, collection of uh, transparencies that Charles used to lecture with and that, that um, uh, Mauritia will be talking about a bit more earlier uh, a bit later um and uh oh let me see excuse me the upstairs continues with architectural themes this is the four square room which it looks a bit wiener werkstatt a bit mackintoshy and um, 
but it's um, uh, it, again, it's these. It, it, it's the, the the square is the fundamental unit of architecture. There's four sides. Forgive me. I'm, I know I'm, I'm running slightly over here, but I'll, I'm going to go a couple more minutes. I'm done. Um, the the Romans with their with their square plans, the Chinese with the square gardens, and so on and so on. Then there is a there is a moon well, uh, so that we have the solar stair and the moon well at the other end of the house. And then there's a bathroom that looks like the bathroom that looks like the sea, very much like Lethaby's preoccupations with architecture and how the, the floor and, the, and the, the floor should emulate the sea, the primordial soup and the ceiling should emulate the heavens and so on. Um, Charles liked nothing better than taking people round this house and, and, and the gardens he designed in the same way with the same kind of cosmic symbolism, using them as a framework for telling stories about architecture, science, about the world, uh, cancer, knowledge, whatever it might be. Um, they were at the, so the house in a way is is an entertainment in the way romantic English gardens used to be an armature for a narrative. So I hope that we can continue to use the house in the same way. The stories might change over time, but the most important thing is that the, they remain relevant, and provocative, and I think probably above all engaging. So we'll leave you now. Or I'll leave you now with a little clip of the man himself in his kitchen talking about the house. In summer, you move to the kitchen, which is uh, Indian summer. And Indian summer is in the Indian Hindu style. So according to what some may consider a very vulgar pun, uh, Indian architecture uh, symbolizes Indian summer. Um, and we've used it there, a particular Hindu kind of architecture, which I happen to love, um, very square and blocky. And the virtue of that is that it actually so heavy and square and blocky that it can open and hold pots and pans and the refrigerator and the oven. All of these very functional aspects of a kitchen fit very nicely into that, um, those heavy shapes. Some people would find it too whimsical. I mean, for instance, it has around the top of the Indian summer is this, instead of a classical trig lift, there's what I call the spoon lift, made out of salad spoons painted marble to tell you it's the kitchen. I mean, here's a place where the symbolism is so obvious that you, uh, you can't miss it. Um, um, but as some uh, wit once said, it's a very stirring mixture. It brings out, you see, the bad taste of food. The ultimate bad days, of course, is if you can't stand the kitchen, get out of the kitchen. Somebody said to him, um, Fantastic. Um, is that it for now, Esther? Yeah? Eddie, That's thank okay. you very much. And now uh, I think we move to Marisha. Yep, just going to. Perfect. Yeah, so um, good evening. Thank you so much for uh, this invitation, uh, Bill, and to, um, well, an earlier invitation really to Esther and uh, Lily Jenks for me to become this inaugural um, artist in residence. So what I thought I could contribute is to tell you a little bit about um, my work uh, as an artist who over the last probably 30 years has explored um, the meaning of, of archives and also built archives um, in, in different uh, moments of my practice. But I think uh, before we um, go through uh, my presentation of, of some of the materials that uh, relate to the archive here, I also wanted to say a few things about, um, uh, well, answer some of kind of Bill's early questions that he has uh, sent uh, to us in preparation for 
uh, this evening. And uh, one of them was uh, what was uh, Maggie's role in this project. Um, and also the other question being uh, what kind of work does an artist in residence do and how does she um, and who does she do it uh, for? So to, to start with, um, for me, the, the Cosmic House is um, not so much a manifesto, but more, um, it's, it's a lecture. Uh, it's a lecture that um, you enter, but I think my question is um, who really delivers that lecture, how uh, that lecture uh, was uh, conceived, um, and, and so importantly, and with this sort of first um, image, I really want to impress how, at least in my mind, it's very much a collaborative project. And as um, it is um, truly very well known to, to most of you, that while, um, well, Charles has um, outlived uh, uh, Maggie, his uh, wife, by about 24 years, it is also that he had so much longer to um, share with us uh, and, uh, uh, well, his, his um, contribution uh, had a chance to reach us in so many different ways. And yet the, the Cosmic House is really a project that uh, both uh, Charles and Maggie um, conceived together. They, they bought the house and uh, worked on its program together and commissioned other people. So it is not only a collaboration between two people and um, a sort of manifestation of their relationship, but also of many other relationships that they had uh, with other people, with other professionals. Um, so what it also does is that um, it's a result of uh, relationships which are emerging from specific um, conditions combining affect, um, education and economy. A house like this could not uh, been put together without a um, certain amount of resources. Now, what I find um, that sort of my affinity with um, um, Charles Jenks and Maggie Keswick Jenks uh, was their desire and ability to build supportive networks. And I think the, the building of the house is an expression of building um, and having built and maintained uh, supportive networks. And that is what connects me. Um, and I think when I think of supportive, I think of intellectually supportive, artistically supportive, and it's a, it's a lasting um, foundation for their endeavors. And in fact, would have, the, the cosmic health would have not have been able to emerge out of social nothingness. So the, the archive is, is an engine, um, and, and I see this very much, especially now when the house is no longer a habitus, which is a, a social space for um, its original inhabitants, uh, but it is a museum. So that uh, transition from a private space, a, if you like, a, a set of conditions that were to do with um, the life and also, you know, these two people were public intellectuals. Uh, they were not just, um, so they were already also part of a larger discourse. And I think what um, is clear to me that they felt very much a necessity of sharing in public and building a public and especially uh, through Charles Jenks's um, activities, um, whether it was um, a, con you know, a set of conversations 
and ongoing um, critical engagement. And he was very much a critic. And as you even uh, see this in, in the film uh, that Eddie has uh, provided an excerpt form from is that he is also self-critical. But his engagement was through lectures, publications, broadcasts, um, and his own amateur recordings of uh, interviews with architects and scientists. And there is a, a very strong sense of a production of knowledge and um, offering, and that knowledge being offered um, for public scrutiny. So this slide is significant. Uh, it's not a slide that I found. It's a slide that was already on, on the website when I started working here in October. And interestingly, you know, this is um, how, when as an artist, you begin working with um, an existing set of conditions. And here, uh, these, uh, these conditions are uh, the house itself and the archive. Um, the archive offers a, a discursive terrain, which is not yet scripted. It is not yet curated. So it allows me as an artist to use it as a raw material. And in this first encounter, this is a, a, a photograph of um, Charles and Maggie after Charles delivered a lecture at uh, Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris in 1981. And the photograph is taken by a Polish photographer, a very well-known Polish photographer, Stachy Kosakowski, who was based in Paris at the time. So, you know, my sort of affinity, if you like, is that, of course, I was aware of, of Kosakowski. Uh, long before I would have been aware of, um, well, Jenks uh, being uh, lecturing in Paris, and, and especially I was not at all aware of uh, Maggie Kazik Jenks before coming to, to this house. Um, and as I open those um, slight scrapers uh, that Eddie has shown us, you know, this is the first thing I see. Um, uh, so Jenks went to Poland twice in 74 and 81. And as it happens, those two dates are um, the dates of me uh, starting at university in 74 and graduating in 81. And as I um, look at the uh, mainly analog materials, uh, and that's also very important that these uh, materials are in a form that is not necessarily also immediately available. Um, so you have the, um, these are um, film, uh, I think super eight film reels, uh, which of course I cannot have access to unless they are um, projected, digitized and so on. But what caught my attention in many of these materials um, is how um, Charles's collaborator is addressed. So this is addressed to Mrs. Charles Jenks. Uh, so it really hides the identity of Maggie Keswick, who is uh, his collaborator. And I think that it, it kind of prompted in me this desire to recover um, Maggie Keswick from um, Mrs. Charles Jenks. And so, you know, I uh, have looked at materials here and also went to Scotland to uh, Portrack, which is a, a small place in, um, uh, near Dumfries and looked at um, the archive, which was in fact moved there after uh, Maggie died in uh, 1995 and started sort of looking at materials that were more related to her. 
And maybe worth uh, mentioning is that uh, Charles and Maggie met at the Architectural Association. So they met as um, professionals and Maggie was already, uh, she has already graduated from uh, literature at Oxford. Uh, so at Portrack, there are more slides, uh, but these are taken by Maggie who um, was uh, the daughter of uh, John and Claire Keswick. And this is also, I think, a very important part of the, what I would say is the kind of foundation of the house, is that you know, there is more than one generation. Uh, there is a continuity, something that I am extremely aware of coming from Poland where um, there was no continuity. You know, I am of a generation whose, um, you know, my parents uh, were born uh, just as the Second World War was uh, starting. And as a family, nothing was left materially from, uh, there is no legacy in material terms. So I'm extremely aware how here, how important it is that, um, there is this sort of generational connection uh, that allows for certain things to happen. So yes, looking through slides, both in uh, the collection here at the Cosmic House and in uh, uh, Port Track, and also uh, discovering that there is more materials which are in the audio, um, these are audio cassettes. Now, I have uh, myself, uh, when I first came to London, which also coincides with uh, the timing of this house. So I arrived in London in uh, June of 1982. So 40 years ago uh, this year. And one of the first thing that I ever did was started recording my encounters uh, and conversations with other people. And I can see that um, uh, Charles uh, did the very same thing. So there are many tapes of interviews, of um, uh, lectures, and also of seminars that have taken place at, Port at Portrack. But there is also uh, an interesting uh, recording from 1987, uh, where Maggie is giving a lecture in Vancouver um, as she, by that time, in fact, 10 years earlier, published a book um, about Chinese gardens. Her parents, in fact, she grew up, for those of you who probably don't know, she grew up in Shanghai and uh, Hong Kong and had um, an incredible insight and I think understanding and love for Chinese culture and especially Chinese gardens. But I do want you to hear uh, Maggie's voice. And uh, it is a good moment to let you hear her. Thank you, Joe. Thank you all very much for coming. Now I've got a very important thing to do here, which is to get this microphone attached to myself with everything falling down. Now, can you hear this? Is that working? Yes? Can you hear now? Could you raise your hands at the back if you can't hear? You can. Is that any better? Yes? All right? Well, I'll try it and see how we get on. So this is the beginning of a lecture, which, you know, so many of us uh, would have been in, in that situation. And the slides that you hear are the slides that uh, were used um, in that lecture. So uh, Maggie has taken many photographs, um, and in fact, all those photographs that are in that box were taken by her during uh, travels in Asia, in China. Um, so to see her as a, um, as a professional and also as a photographer um, is something that you know I am. Uh, interested in. 
and here she is, um, you know, looking down the camera with her father, uh, John Keswick, who was a very important uh, person in her life. Uh, one of these early photographs uh, where she is probably around, I don't know, five years old, and uh, her father is showing her how to plant. And, you know, it is, if you think of the cosmic, uh, that's probably also where you need to look, is this relationship to nature, uh, which she is also uh, very, very aware of while um, writing this book of, um, about Chinese gardens. This was a very important publication and a publication that um, first appeared in uh, 1977. So while um, Jenks, Charles Jenks is working on his um, uh, postmodernist uh, manifesto, uh, she was um, publishing and uh, obviously before that researching um, her book. Uh, but here is also, um, these are pages from Maggie's uh, notebooks. And uh, this is her direct involvement uh, in the Cosmic House in uh, planning the garden but also in a kind of less idealistic way, um, being aware of you know, what kind of hardware needs to be ordered and uh, what are the prices of all these things. So I think you know, it's very important to remember that all this idealism uh, is also, you know, has had its um, uh, underlining kind of everyday uh, management uh, issues which anyone who has ever done any uh, refurbishment of a house or even more than that would be aware of. Uh, this is um, one of her watercolors planning uh, the gardens, being very aware of colors, being very aware of the palette. And in fact, while um, Jenks has expressed and has been very, very attached to language and expressed himself through writing, uh, Maggie really expressed herself through uh, drawing um, and uh, design of gardens. So this is the um, garden at the back of the Cosmic House designed uh, by Maggie. Uh, what I also thought would be interesting to just bring to your attention that it's this timing, um, uh, important exhibition which took place in 1985 at the Pompidou Center, which was um, curated uh, by a philosopher. Because I think, you know, essentially Jenks is also a philosopher, a theorist, um, someone who writes, and his design work is very much informed by um, his, um, yeah, his, his understanding of theory. And that exhibition, this is a poster for uh, Les Immateriaux, um, an exhibition curated by um, Jean-François Lyotard uh, for the Saint Pompidou, which is also a manifesto of uh, postmodernism. And interestingly, that is an exhibition which you enter through the Egyptian uh, relief. And we have the Egyptian um, room in the cosmic house. So I think um, there was definitely a conversation, if not an actual conversation. Uh, Charles was constantly in conversation intellectually with um, his peers. Uh, this book is the uh, book by Lyotard, The Postmodern Explained to Children, which is uh, actually a series of letters. And it's heavily um, underlined and um, used uh, in conversation by, by Jenks. And as you can see, the postmodern 
is not the same as postmodernity or postmodernism. Uh, so, you know, this is this awareness, which is something that uh, is important to me, that while I definitely uh, don't have uh, maybe so much interest in postmodernism, I do have an interest in how, um, and in fact, this is according to, to Leotard, um, who uh, interestingly wrote a lot about Duchamp, is that he treats Duchamp as um, a kind of proto-postmodernist. And when the Centre Pompidou opened in 1977, its first exhibition was a uh, Duchamp retrospective for which Lyotard uh, wrote a um, essay for the catalogue. And I think this is a, a, a note which um, I like very much. I mean, those uh, marginalia are not easy to decipher. Uh, you have to be very determined to, to read uh, Jenks's handwriting. Uh, but it's also very touching once you do decipher it. So here you can see this arrow. And it, it says here, a favorite leotard metaphor is liquidating. And um, yeah, I find that really important for uh, my work here. And this uh, last slide is sort of taking you into another space. Uh, here, uh, a photograph taken by Maggie Keswick at Portrack, uh, her family uh, home in Scotland where um, between, I think, uh, 93 and uh, 96, there were several seminars, um, which were called portrait seminars. And there are these um, tape recordings of those seminars, where scientists, um, designers, um, people would be invited for a, a period of time to have conversations, to argue, to um, really produce knowledge. And um, I have uh, today had a visit from uh, a group of students uh, from the Courtauld Institute. Also Courtauld and Warburg Institutes are connected. Um, and maybe Bill can say something more about that. But I think uh, this is how I see my role here as well is to kind of activate something of the archive and um, to set up, to breathe life um, to the house uh, through encounters with other people and uh, to kind of set up another kind of conversation um, that uh, many of those have taken place in this house and now with the Jenks Foundation uh, will continue. So my contribution is maybe not so much adding something, uh, but um, reconfiguring uh, certain priorities that uh, already uh, have been explored and making something a voice um, and maybe bring to, to wider attention uh, the role of uh, women and especially Maggie Keswick uh, to this project. Marvelous. Marisha, thank you so much. And thanks to all three of you for uh, putting so much uh, on the cosmic table. Um, if you just stop sharing and I will now repin Eddie and Esther and myself we have about 20 minutes for some questions. I'll just ask one or two things very quickly. There are a lot of really interesting people here in the audience who I'd love to hear from, and I'm sure you guys would too. So I'll keep my questions very, very brief because I actually, as Marisha said, I had sent a few in advance uh, to help the three of you think about what to talk about. And so the first question I asked, and the biggest one is, what is the cosmic house exactly? Um, it was a house, it was a, a, a building, it was a, a couple's project. Um, 
what is it now? And you, you've really referred to it in an interestingly complex range of ways, just between the three of you, uh, built manifesto, lecture, foundation, archive, working library, uh, and, and much more. But actually, um, in many ways, you all seemed to settle on museum. That was a word you were all happy using. And I want to put a little bit of pressure on that because of the overarching question I have, I suppose, is probably the single most um, uh, pressing question, which is about the relationship of the house and its project to history, to time, because it draws itself on the past. I mean, that very first uh, essay that uh, Esther showed, which is now on the website, but the presentness of the past um, was isms, ism, wasms, isms. I mean, there are all kinds of plays on the awareness of time. The house itself, of course, draws particularly on uh, the modification or as postmodernism ar in architecture tends to do uh, on a number of key styles or reference points from the past. Um, the idea of the cosmic drawing uh, on things like Egyptian uh, uh, style, very common in, in uh, postmodern architecture. So I'm really interested in how you're presenting and, and preserving a particular past. But the key question in a way is, how do you avoid the museum becoming a mausoleum? How do you avoid the house simply being uh, closed, frozen as a tribute to or memorial to these extraordinary people and their project. I hope that makes sense. That was a really long question, but I hope it gives you something to engage with. So I'd love to hear from all of you, uh, ideally, about this issue. I don't know, Eddie or Esther? I think Esther. <laughs> Esther I'm going to leave Esther to start that one off. OK. <clears throat> I'm starting, but Eddie, you're the keeper. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. Perhaps museum is not the most precise way of referring to it. It's a house museum, but it is so much more than a house museum. And I think that um, if you go on a website, I'm not going to go back to share the screen, but there is this kind of very interesting symmetry between the cosmic house website and pages which is basically about the house museum and visitor information and just really factual information about the history and the design and everything you need to know in order to come here and visit and then there's the Jenks foundation which is much broader in its remit and it's much more geared to perhaps a more specialist but more international audience of really engaging with the intellectual work of Charles and in the archive and it is the archive is an engine, you know, that is generating our program, but I think that the output is very contemporary. And this is something that we were also, it's the, the website is designed by John Morgan, and that they are just really wonderful. Also, just trying to think, you know, the medium is the message, and, you know, just trying to think about how to contrast these two languages, the website that is about the Hearts Museum, that is really much borrowing from this very strong postmodern aesthetic, contrasting that with a much more pure contemporary aesthetic where we are really just trying to engage with ideas and what is the relevance and how we can revisit some of these core themes from the archive. So I think that there is a little bit of a, we're still, you know, I have to be honest, we are just about to start, we are about to launch. It's still very new and I think that we still need to work out how these two kind of sides correlate and will exactly be you know, how we can make sense and the balance between the two. But yeah. This is how we are starting to think about. I don't know if that is yeah, that, your that question. That really helps. Yeah, that really helps. And of but course, I, would... I should just acknowledge the fact that you opened during COVID and so much of this had to happen in a world that was largely closed down. I'm sure as we all reopen and uh, reactivate uh, ourselves, uh, these visits, these projects, Marisha's example of class visits, which we at the Warburg are very much looking forward to making uh, with you. Um, we'll, we'll keep it uh, alive for sure. But uh, Eddie, I'd, I'd be curious. Yeah. What... I, I was just going to add in, in briefly, because I know people want to ask questions, but the, the obvious parallel is the Sony Museum. Yeah. 
and uh, in, in many ways they are they are very similar, but in, in other ways they are very dissimilar. So this is from a period of very recent history. Soane, when, when he built uh, his house, was it was already stuffed with incredibly valuable antiquities. This house is very recent, and in a way its recentness is what saved it, because postmodernism went through a period of extreme unpopularity, and almost all postmodern interiors were destroyed. <laughs> So it, it's kind of it's kind of got its grade one listing, which is almost insane. You know, the same as Westminster Cathedral, uh, Westminster Abbey, and St Paul's Cathedral, because of the rarity of, of, of this survivor, its intactness. You know, it was it was it was it was used up to the end for exactly what it was intended to. I think there's another there's a the, there's another difference with the Soane Museum is that Soane conceived of his house, I think, partly as a teaching tool. You know, he had yeah. students there, and the antiquities were very important for that and partly as a sales brochure. You know, it was to advertise his skills as an architect. Charles was a little different. He didn't have to sell his uh, story. He didn't have to sell his work, his design work. And I think we now have gone beyond that didactic idea of a teaching tool. Uh, and instead, you know, we would allow people to discover, like Mauritia is doing, to discover the narratives that they uh, that they are interested in here. So rather than rather than kind of projecting onto them what they should learn, you know, we, we would encourage people to find things here that then lead them into interesting, you know, avenues of discovery. So I think maybe that's a that's a, a kind of key difference. Yeah, and perhaps just to come back to the question of preservation, you know, maybe we are idealistic in the beginning of the project, but, you know, we had already a couple of months when the public was coming in and we are quite light touch. So we encourage people to, you know, the house is both domestic and both an institution and we are kind of moving in between and also with the laboratory projects. So the spaces are in use and, you know, people can use the furniture, people can sit down, people can come here and make a cup of tea in the, uh, in the summer room. I mean, not the general visitors necessarily, but you know, the house is actually alive and it is filled with life. Yeah. Um, but just to be clear, so it is fixed in a way in its program, both by its being listed and by being uh, given by, by the Jenkses. So um, so you won't, you won't make architectural changes uh, yourselves? No. Okay, just wanted to be clear. Uh, Marisha, do you want to come in on this at all? Yeah, just very quickly, because I, I see quite a lot of hands raised, so there's obviously other questions. Uh, but I, I see it um, slightly differently. You know, what, what is astonishing is that the, the way, what you see in the house is exactly what was already here in 1985. So it is something that is already, um, even though people uh, were living here, uh, it was, uh, it's sort of private and public function uh, was already embedded um, during the, the life uh, definitely of, of Charles and Maggie here and then later of um, Charles and Louisa, who also um, lived here. So I think, you know, th this is, um, for me, what is alive and what will secure the relevance of this project is that it is a discursive terrain. Um, and that's what's, what's most uh, interesting, is that looking at the past kind of opens up something for us um, to reflect upon. And any relationship with the past is always complicated. Um, you know, who narrates, who um, says what, in under what circumstances. So this idea that um, mm, it is just about preservation, I don't think, um, any museum is under any illusion that it can simply do that. Um, I mean, preservation is just something that addresses, you know, um, material things, but here it's really the question of value. What is of value here that can uh, keep on resonating? 